Most of my life I was an atheist with a chip on my shoulder. Religious people to me were all intellectually weak, silly, and venal. And worse, they wanted people like me stripped of my legal rights or dead. This is what I believed. I had built my identity on being an oppressed gay, an oppressed minority, and I blamed all of my troubles in life on societal homophobia. To keep this up, I had to believe that all religious people were not only bigots, but actual dangers to my life. And there were plenty of leftist progressives, Unitarians, fellow atheists around to tell me that I was right about these Christians. They did hate me, and they had to be legally and culturally defeated because we were all in danger. And then I had a personal crisis in 2016 that destabilized everything I thought I knew about family, love, politics, power, and being a human. This eventually lead, led to my politics changing to small c conservatism. And like many others, I was canceled socially. I lost almost all of my friends. I lost my career. And some of the most genuine and understanding people who came into my life after my change of mind were Christians. Unlike my secular friends from those days, these people were not obnoxiously judgmental. Even though I hadn't become a believer, they didn't bang on about how I was going to hell. They weren't afraid to be seen to be my Facebook friends, unlike my actual friends from those days, so I thought. It was my new religious friends, not my secular atheist friends, who extended actual tolerance to me. And it was more than tolerance, they were actually willing to talk over our differences without socially casting me out. This week we're going to talk about the price that we pay for refusing to open our minds, for refusing to reconsider what we think is true. Fear is behind our resistance to changing our minds, and fear has ordinary people today at each other's throats, doing the dividing that our elite political and moneyed class wants us to do. From dystopian Burlington, Vermont, this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships from a psychological perspective. It's March 30th, 2024, and I'm Joshua Slocum. Welcome to Disaffected. We've been following the story of a girl named Dagny Benedict. She's also been called Nex Benedict. She's the 16-year-old girl from Oklahoma who we now know killed herself. She's been referred to by everyone in the media by her alleged non-binary name, Nex Benedict. You will recall that the media and LGBTQ organizations and activists claimed that other girls in her high school bathroom beat her up, Dagny, and that she died because of non-binary bigotry, phobia, and hate. Even after the autopsy report came out showing that she had intentionally overdosed on Prozac and Benadryl, the activists and media kept up the story. No facts make any difference when narcissistic emotion is driving an issue. Well, now we find out that Dagny's story is as sadly predictable as you could want. Nothing about this is going to surprise you. If you understand what childhood trauma and early childhood abuse does to a young person's mind. Dagny Benedict's sad life had all the hallmarks of a girl who was sexually abused. This is from Fox in Oklahoma. <clears throat> the 11 pages released indicate handwritten notes, quote, suggestive of self-harm were found in Nex's room by family members, and that the teen has a history of, quote, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, self-harm, cutting, end quote. <clears throat> in other words, Dagny Benedict showed a trauma response to abuse. Just like most girls who end up anorexic, bulimic, with alleged multiple personalities, or transing themselves, there's a reason for that. This is reporting that comes from Chad Felix Green, journalist Chad Felix Green in redstate.com. I'll read a little bit to you. On July 27, 2019, when Dagny was 11 years old, an arrest warrant was issued for James Everett Hughes, Dagny's father. He was arrested on July 31st, 2019 in Sebastian County, Arkansas. The charge was for rape 
of a minor under the age of 14. During the time period between May 2017 and August 2017, when Dagny was nine years old. Among many witnesses was Sue Benedict, the grandmother who would adopt Dagny in 2019. A quote for you. <clears throat> Case details are difficult to read and the following information is graphic. In the report, Dagny, age 11, would tell investigators her father anally raped her when she was nine years old. She reported that he had molested her for years prior, end quote. And <clears throat> here's some of her legal records. This is the booking history for James Everett Hughes. And we see that he was booked in 2019 and the count was rape of someone under 14 years old. You know, my, in, in recent shows, my friend George remarked that human beings and their motivations aren't that complicated, and he's right. Our motivations aren't that complicated. And our behaviors are stereotyped. We humans tend to go right and wrong in, in stereotyped ways. And so it is with Dagny Benedict. It wasn't bigotry that killed her. It wasn't non-binary phobia, and it wasn't state legislation encouraging anti-LGBTQ hate, as we hear endlessly. <clears throat> it was family abuse. It was cluster B. Now, there's no popular fiction as powerful as the myth of transgenderism. It's the most extreme symptom of underlying woke ideology. Did you ever think that people would become convinced that men and women aren't actually real? Did you ever imagine that we'd cut children's chests and crotches up and call that loving and affirming health care? The most grotesque fairy tales cannot approach the brutality of the real world that we live in in the 21st century. At bottom, woke is disconnection from reality. I suspect a great number of people, woke people, know deep down somewhere that they're in a delusion. But if they're like I was, they can't stop juggling these platters full of lies because that would force them to confront the lie that they've been participating in and that's emotionally difficult. The gym chain, Planet Fitness, has fully committed to this lie with predictable consequences. Headline, <clears throat> ousted Planis Fitness member to Newsmax on mission for women. From the story, an Alaska woman booted from Planet Fitness after taking a photo of a transgender woman shaving in a female locker room told Newsmax on Thursday the experience has fueled her mission to protect the right of women to feel safe in gender-specific spaces. Patricia Silva, in an exclusive interview on National Report, recounted her confrontation with the trans fitness member in a video that immediately went viral. And we've got a picture here of the lady that Patricia encountered. Very dainty, isn't he? That's right. Planet Fitness is revoking women's membership, men's too, but mainly women's memberships when they complain about a naked man in the women's locker room. Quote, this is uh, Patricia Silva speaking. I said, you know, you're a man with a penis. You need to leave. And he argued with me and said, I'm LGB. I'm transitioning and I can stay. Uh, you know, Kevin pointed this out to me. If that's what he said, I'm LGB, he didn't even include the T part. Where's the T? That's the part you said we can't leave out. That's you. <laughs> Come on. If you're going to abuse, do it right. Next quote. Again, this is Patricia Silva speaking. And as I walked out the front door, I stood at the edge of the bathroom because I wanted everybody in the building to hear me. So I said, excuse me, there's a man in the women's locker room shaving his face and it's not okay. I walked outside and I videoed that message. <laughs> the public hasn't taken kindly to this. It's, it's, it's actually interesting. 
we're starting to see actual public pushback. People are saying in public to news media, alternative media still, but to news media and online that this stuff is absolute nonsense and they're not going to stand for it anymore. I hope to see more of that. I hope that this I hope we get to the peak of this. People have talked about peak trans for a long time, and there have been many peaks <laughs> that a lot of us have gotten to over the past six or seven years, but it's time for the real peak to happen so that we can go on the downslope and get rid of this stuff. But at any rate, uh, people are waking up to this. They're unhappy about it. They're hammering Planet Fitness on social media, and the company has lost $400 million in market value this past week which is also glorious to see. It's very nice to see how much market capitalization Bud Light lost uh, earlier this year, or was it late last year, um, when people started boycotting Bud Light for partnering with, I'm sorry, I, guess, <laughs> I keep thinking of him as Millen Dulvaney. <laughs> the 365 days of girlhood little gay man who's been prancing around and got a custom Bud Light uh, can with his uh, lady face on it. But Planet Fitness is not backing off despite all the pushback. Woke trans lunacy has fully infected this company. The account Libs of TikTok got a hold of some of the employee manual. Let's take a look. First one. All members and team members may use the Planet Fitness locker room facilities and programs based on their self-reported gender identity. These facilities include bathrooms, showers, and all other facilities separated by sex. What do you mean separated by sex? <laughs> you see, they can't even keep up with their own lie. Self-reported gender identity, but the rooms are separated by sex. No, they're not. They're unisex. All of your bathrooms and locker rooms, Planet Fitness, are unisex. You say so yourselves. <laughs> Here's another excerpt. Planet Fitness team members and members should address transgender and non-binary members and other team members with preferred names, titles, pronouns, and other terms consistent with their self-reported gender identity. If a team member or member accidentally misgenders someone, please apologize, no. Ask the member or team member for their preferred pronouns and use those going forward. I'm so sick of that phrase. Going forward, do you know what I hate even more than that? Going forward, forward, there's an R in there. But don't say going forward, thank you. <laughs> you got to use not only their pronouns, but their preferred titles. So if I say that I'm Marie of Romania, you have to call me Your Grace. You have to. It's Planet Fitness rules. One more excerpt. <laughs> Planet Fitness reserves the right to take appropriate action up to and including termination of a person's membership or employment immediately for any violation of this policy or club rule. It is cluster B to the core. Service the narcissist. Do what the narcissist tells you to do. Don't believe your lying eyes. If you don't repeat the lie, you'll force me to take away all your nice things. You wouldn't want that, would you? Narcissistic abuse can turn a target into a recruit turn somebody into a flying monkey who does the dirty work of the disordered. But it can also radicalize people. We're going to leave off here with uh, one more quote from Patricia Silva. What are my rights, Silva said. I would like an investigation over this man walking in plat Planet Fitness and with the authority to go into the bathroom without any validation that he is a man or female. And they basically told me I had no rights, that he has every right because he identifies as a girl. I took that picture to show the community I was bringing awareness to Fairbanks, Fairbanks, Alaska. All right. Coming up on a break. And as you know, we don't have advertisers, but we do have you, our loyal audience. Will you help us make the show? 
If you want to contribute, throw a few bucks into the tip jar and you just want to do a one-off, we would love it and appreciate it. Visit disaffected.com and click on support us. Put in a buck, five bucks, 10 bucks, 30 bucks, a million dollars. Do you want to become a regular supporting member and get access to our private Discord chat server full of fellow disaffectants? There's two ways to do it. You can sign up and become a monthly supporter at disaffectedpod.substack.com or hop over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. We'll see you after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform. So make sure you subscribe today. You will have noticed the woke's interest in empowering, as they call it, children and young people. They tell us that children know better than adults, children are the future, children are wise. They assure us that children can know accurately that they're not the sex that they actually are, and that those same children can consent to having their bodies chemically and surgically mutilated and permanently sterilized so that they can never make the choice to have their own children later in life when they're adults. And this is because woke is Marxist communism, and communism relies on recruiting youth. Setting children against their parents and against adults, inverting the hierarchy, is how collectivists accomplish their very adult goals of political domination. The left takes a similar approach to illegal aliens. Like children, illegal aliens are not qualified to be steering government. Isn't that obvious? But for the woke, that's what makes them the most qualified. Here's a story from the Fox News affiliate in Washington, D.C. A federal judge on Thursday tossed a conservative legal group's lawsuit against a controversial Washington, D.C. law that allows non-citizens, including illegal immigrants and foreign embassy staff members, to vote in municipal elections. In a 12-page opinion, Judge Amy Berman Jackson said the plaintiffs, a group of U.S. citizen voters represented by the Immigration Reform Law Institute, lacked standing to challenge the law because they could not demonstrate how they are harmed by non-citizens who vote and run for local office. So this D.C. law municipal law allows illegal aliens to vote, not just immigrants, not just legal immigrants, but actual border jumpers, and apparently allows them to run for office, too. You know, it's it's already beyond the pale that we have political bodies and municipalities that are even floating the idea that non-citizens ought to be able to vote or to run for office. I mean, it's already gone too far. But here we are trying to put the genie back in the bottle, and our courts are relying heavily on the concept of standing to throw out lawsuits that they don't want to have to consider and they don't want to have to decide the right way. All a court has to do is say that plaintiffs lack standing, that they're not affected by the issue the way they claim to be affected by it, and all of a sudden the legal complaint vanishes. Quote, Most of this is a quote from the judge. The complaint does not include facts showing plaintiffs' right to vote has been denied, that they have been subjected to discrimination or inequitable treatment, or denied opportunities when compared to another group, or that their rights of citizens have been subordinated merely because of their father's country of origin, Judge Jackson wrote. It's not hurting you. Why do you care? That's a popular way to shut up to shut people up, to avoid answering the question. Why do you care? Been getting a lot of why do you care lately. You see it a lot on, on social media when you talk about an issue. Why are you so obsessed with this? The, the people like the people who are uh, carving up uh, children's genitals and when you say you shouldn't carve up children's genitals, you'll get back from them. Why are you so obsessed with children's genitals? I mean, it's a mad reversal. 
the problem in this case is not that these American citizens don't have a right to vote. They're not making that claim. The problem is that political bodies and municipalities are allowing non-citizens to vote and direct how citizen taxpayer money is spent in their own country. They're allowing non-citizens to vote on issues that affect the rights, the legal rights of citizens. Does a person who happens to walk down the road that I live on, but who doesn't live with me, do they get to decide what vegetables I grow in my garden? Do they get to tell me how to spend my household maintenance budget? Would anyone even ask this question? Of course not. And the plaintiffs in this case are clear about this issue. Here's another quote. The law dilutes the vote of every U.S. citizen voter in the district. Because it does so, the D.C. Non-Citizen Voting Act is subject to review under both the equal protection and the substantive due process components of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the IRLI argued Immigration Reform Law Institute that's representing the individual Americans who are trying to sue. But Judge Amy Berman Jackson pretends that she does not understand this. And so she makes sure to say that the IRLI doesn't have standing by pretending that they're complaining about something that they're not actually complaining about. <laughs> Quote, however, the judge agreed with the defendants that the complaint should be dismissed because the plaintiffs lacked standing to sue. Quote, this is from the judge, quote, in some plaintiffs have not alleged that they have been personally subjected to any sort of disadvantage as individual voters by virtue of the fact that non-citizens are permitted to vote too. You know, there's no talking to this. There's no responding to this because legal reasoning isn't happening for Judge Jackson. This is a judge being consciously disingenuous, in my view. And I wonder how much of it is attributable to misplaced maternal instinct to go support the alleged underdog. Because we see a lot of that in modern society. That's what a lot of woke is about. It's misplaced and hijacked maternal instincts and female empathy for alleged underdogs taken to the extreme. And one of the extremes is, is how you see so many liberal women stumping for trans inclusion and everything. It reminds me of, of the Manson girls or of the serial, the fans of serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer or Ted Bundy or any of these guys, these groupy women who write to violent men in prison and ask him to marry them. It's the same thing. It's just a difference of degree. Why are, why are Americans never the underdogs for these people? Why is that an impossible position for us to occupy? Why are we always in the position of being taken from and then blamed for it when we complain? Well, it almost feels cluster B. <laughs> All right. In the past few years, we've seen a new side of American public school teachers. Gone are the days of tweed, skirts, and suits and ties. Today's teachers dress like children. They put metal all over their faces. They dye their hair blue or pink. And they talk to primary school students about their sexualities. If we hadn't seen this with our own eyes, I don't think we'd believe it. We've got female teachers with OnlyFans accounts taking their clothes off online for money, then acting shocked when they get fired from their teaching jobs. And they are shocked. These women seem to genuinely believe that they have done nothing wrong. And why wouldn't they believe that? They've grown up in a world where there are no boundaries at all between public and private, where their demands are met with instant compliance, and where they've been told that being a whore is a respectable profession. Sex work is work, isn't it? That's what happens when you use the term sex worker instead of prostitute. You are helping woke. You're doing woke's job. Please don't use that phrase. It's prostitute or whore. Sex worker. So given all that, why wouldn't Detroit teacher Dominique Brown think that she could be a gangsta rapper on the side. She's a uh, 
She's an elementary school teacher, or no, high school teacher, excuse me. This comes from the Daily Mail. A high school history teacher from Detroit lost her job after parents complained about her side hustle as a rapper and is now planning to take legal action against the school. Dominique Brown, 32, was named Teacher of the Month in December at Taylor Preparatory High School in Detroit, Michigan. However, the history teacher had to defend her extracurricular rap career to the school for five months after a parent anonymously filed a complaint in October 2023. We have a picture of the lovely Miss Brown. Here she is. For those of you who are listening on audio, she's got her mouth, she's got blowjob mouth, you know. Dick goes here, that's what that is. And she's looking over her shoulder with her ass sticking toward the camera. Oh, you want to know her rap name? It's Drippin' Honey. Drippin', not dripping, Drippin' Honey. Take a listen. Motown baby going crazy like the 80s. Motown baby going crazy like the 80s. Motown baby going crazy like the 80s. I put it on the floor and I dare bitch to take it. Niggas running around the city. Owe me money, shit is silly. Buy my money just like 50 hoes. Mad I got the power and the juice. Nah, been talking shit. I'm calling for it to online. This nigga texting me, but I ain't never got the time. No, he asked how I'm doing, bitch. I'm always on the grind. I'm just getting started if a nigga think I'm lying. The money's where my mind at. Got that raw honey, you can find me with a high vet. Real recognize, real who the fuck is y'all? Get that nigga playing, I watch him drop the ball. Niggas wanna blame me, how the fuck you fall? If my back against the wall, run it up till I can't no more. I ain't no hoe, I'm about to do. Switch what do you mean I ain't no hoe? Yes, you are. Eyes, Look at you. Everything I touch though. Hey, I get everything I touch though. Motown baby going crazy like the 80s. 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 If a nigga think it's sweet, come and taste it if you got chase. Bitch, I'm tasting take all forms. Bitch, give me your EBT. 75 North Beach. Your EBT. The <laughs> These hoes mad because they HOE. These niggas stay on me. I'm in the A headed back to the DTE. I'm big drip ho CC me. On another level that they really can't believe. Carrying these bitches because I'm TTG. It's FOE. I should call this bitch just like Can we me. get a new get court, money. please? That's a TIP. I'm running up like, yeah, we go see. I'm bitch, I really got motion. I put a nigga on. Bitch, it's chest. Now check this. Watching every move, bitch. I'm the queen. At the crib, watch the cameras, bitch. Fuck you, bitch. <laughs> you too, honey. I love you. Oh, my God. Now, like the judge in the last story, Miss Honey is pretending that she doesn't understand the nature of the complaint against her. Quote, the first meeting was with my dean and my principal, and they were just telling me, hey, a parent said that they've seen your social media and that you're a bad influence because you're a rapper, Brown said. Nope, not because you're a rapper, because your rap is filthy, obscene, and vulgar. I couldn't get all of the lyrics, but I heard bitches, hoes, niggas, and who the fuck is y'all? <laughs> it's all just so unfair, though. Why should why should her artistic aspirations be held against her? God. <laughs> Next quote. Again from Miss Honey. I was like, hey, well, can we tell that parent to come in and see professionalism? See me in a classroom? See me after school? See me at all the games? See me dropping kids off every day? Buying food? Can they come see me in my element before they try to say I'm unprofessional? Can someone please get Miss Honey a drip pan? Thank you. Yep. As my therapist once asked me in a conversation, what quality was commonly found commonly among people with personality disorders? And I was actually stumped by this because he said that the answer wouldn't come from any of the traits or lists of symptoms in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So I, I didn't know and I had to ask him. And he answered the question and he said being completely disconnected from reality. And that's a jarring thought because it makes us have to contemplate just what percentage of the population under that um, 
that way of counting just what percentage of the population is in fact personality disordered because it's sure as shit more than five or six percent of people who are completely disconnected from reality. And it's certainly a, a very large portion of the young left. This story comes from Vanderbilt University, courtesy of the Tennessean newspaper. Quote, student protests rocked Vanderbilt University this week after a sit-in at an administration building that began Tuesday resulted in the arrest of four students. The students began pro protesting Tuesday morning after an amendment to the Vanderbilt Student Government Constitution, which would prevent student government funds from going to certain businesses that support Israel, was removed by administration officials from a student ballot in late March. The students want the school to take a boycott, divest, sanction, or BDS approach to uh, the Israel-Hamas-Gaza conflict. The school said no. The, the student body may not change the student government constitution to reflect their current political goals. So the students went berserk, naturally. They apparently took over the chancellor's office with a sit-in. Um, and I think I saw on social media the other day that some of them were claiming to be on a, a day-long hunger strike. <laughs> That's just called skipping a meal. <laughs> and at least three, um, at least four students were arrested, one for bodily injury. I don't have any more details than that. And I'm actually, I'm not interested in critiquing their views on Israel, Hamas, uh, and Gaza. Uh, this is a content-neutral um, analysis. What To me, what happened in a private room is more interesting than that larger question. Listen to these students demand that a school staff member guarantee them that they won't be arrested if they leave the building. It's like a serious situation. I need to know there's someone here who's going to go into like toxic And we will take them. care, but we're going to escort them it's, out. Okay, the she, hold her. on, hold on. She leaves the building and then what happens? If we, if we leave the building, right, let's take her back to her room and get food. And that's all I can tell you right now, right? Get food, I get need drink. to know what is going to happen when she leaves the building. She's not, she's not going to be arrested if she leaves the building. Okay. Right. So we will not be arrested as soon as we leave the building. No, if you leave the, no, you're not going to be arrested as soon as you leave the building, right? If you want to go back and get, I don't know. If, if I knew, I would tell you. Why don't because you know? I don't know. Okay, who the hell can you call? So who knows? Right. Well, I don't, I don't know yet. All I know is. All I know, all I know is, if we have somebody that's a medical situation, let's get them the medical attention they need. Oh let's get her God. to her room, right? And I'm telling you, when you go out the room, you're not going to be arrested for leaving the building. She does not feel safe. You have verified nothing for her. All you said is a letter. She's not arrested. If she goes to her room, she is arrested. That's not what I said. No, that's that not what I said. You said she cannot that's stay in her room. What I said. You didn't say she could stay in her room, though. Uh, well, I, well, I can. You have verified nothing for her. When did that become normal? There's someone here who's going to go into toxic shock if she can't get to the bathroom. This young woman actually said that someone is going to get toxic shock syndrome if they don't let her go to the bathroom and change her tampon right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I re <laughs> never mind. I'll never mind. I remember learning about toxic shock syndrome from sitting on the toilet when I was a kid because you have to read something. So it's either shampoo bottles or boxes of tampons. <laughs> so I learned all about it when I was a kid. J just sit with that. Sit with the fact that this young woman actually... Does she actually believe that if the tampon gets five minutes stale, that, um, okay. The question is, is this young woman actually this nuts or is that just the excuse that she's reaching for? Uh, who in the world has ever said, I'm going to get toxic shock syndrome in my cooch if you don't let me go to the bathroom right now? Who has ever said that? And the, this this student, this young woman, she is in full histrionic meltdown mode. She's doing the hand slapping thing to punctuate her words. She's screaming, screaming at someone that she is requesting help and information from. 
as if that's the best way to get compliance. And and I, did you see her? She's bodily trembling behind that face mask, that COVID mask. This is not normal behavior. And, and did you hear the young man at the end, too? He tells the professor that they, these students, they can't leave the room because the professor did not explicitly say that the girl was allowed to go to her room. See, he, see, the professor only said that they wouldn't get arrested if they leave the building, but he did not say that she was allowed to go to her room. He did not verify that for her. Th these kids, they're, pro they're probably in their 20s. They're, they're actually adults, theoretically. Are they really this unable to think for themselves? Do they truly think that every single possible non-arrest scenario has to be specifically enumerated and guaranteed to them or they're not safe? Or are they just pretending to be this timid and unable to think and they're just using this as an excuse to bedevil the staff? I don't know. You could make a reasonable argument for either one of those. <sighs> Unbelievable. All right, we're coming up on a break, but I have a question for you. Do you have a problem, a relationship problem with a relative, a boss, a friend? Is woke infiltrating your professional field, your church, your hobby group? Do your friends and family tell you that you're too sensitive when you bring it up? Does it seem like the bullying loudmouth in your group gets all the deference no matter what he does? Well, you can talk to me about this. Book a session at joshuaslocum.net. I offer one hour consultations to help you figure out your situation and what the possible solutions might be and how to prepare yourself. You know, lately, a number of people who have booked time with me have told me that they're coming because they can't even trust their own therapist or their own clergyman to take them seriously when they complain about a problem with the narcissistic dynamics in their life. I'll take you seriously and I won't tell you that you're crazy unless you are. <laughs> I'd love to help you if I can. Visit joshuaslocum.net and click book now. And if you're a returning client or a monthly uh, disaffected supporter, you get a discount too. We'll see you after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Ladies and gentlemen and eunuchs, it is time once again for the segment Pupoli du Mukoli, where we roast the skin of everyone. Let's go. No, not my eyeballs. My balls. You know, down there at the danglers. Yeah, I had them removed in 2018. It's called an orchiectomy. As I consider myself to be a genderless dragon, and I will at some point get a full penectomy, and I will have no gender. No genitalia to identify my gender. I love that. Yeah. Bye-bye, balls. Bye-bye. It's been nice enough to you. Buh-bye, balls. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, buh-bye. Okay, buh-bye now. Buh-bye. If you're wondering if this is Cluster B, it is. <laughs> this, I know you've seen this lizard guy before. I, I almost, I, 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 I was at war with myself over including this in Potpourri de Mockery because he is, he's so crazy. I almost feel bad making fun of him, but not really. I'll tell you what this reminds me of more than anything. Do you remember that scene in The Exorcist when uh, Reagan, the little girl who was possessed, 
is, um, I think she's downstairs at the dinner party, and she all of a sudden she just she gets a notion that she's gonna snake out to people. So she's all like, she starts looking. She gets down on the on the floor and goes. <laughs> and then she's all like, you're going to die up there. All right. Speaking of orchiectomies, I wonder if that particular surgery was on this lovely lady man's mind when he made up his social media profile. I'd like to introduce you to Orchia Min. <laughs> Orchia Min. Now, that is either a reference to orchiectomies or to killer whales. Either one would be appropriate. Uh, so, Orchia Min describes they self as a proud transgender lesbian and trans rights activist, she, her, be kind, be strong, heart emoji. <laughs> and I helpfully circled a key portion of the bio for you. It says, a huge problem for an insane world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cause, see, because when I saw Miss Min, the first thing I thought to myself was retarded job of the hut. So I immediately ran to an AI image generator and typed in retarded job of the hut and got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think the AI misgendered Jabba, though, and there seems to be a structural problem with the brassiere. Anyway, um, I only got away with the word retarded on the first attempt and the first prompt, though, because I tried some variations on that, um, moving the words around, and suddenly the AI told me that it had detected, quote, unsafe content. <laughs> every time I typed the word retarded. So somehow I got through on the first try, but after that, I guess it... Well, is this an example of how they learn, <laughs> right? Oh, so speaking of breastuses, Twitter is chock full of e hoes lately. Have you noticed them? Half the time when I post on there, I get three or four of these digital doxies trying to tempt me with their sex parts. They're all boobs in bio or pussy in bio, <laughs> and I'm all, what, no dick in bio? Okay. Well, for example, like this. This is Miss Donna Robinson, because she totally is a real person who exists. My nude pussy in bio, check now. <laughs> well, the promise of pussy is not enough anymore. The enterprising Eho has to offer us crazy mixed up sex parts to stand out from the crowd. Because now I'm getting stuff like this. <laughs> My crazy boobs in profile, check now. <laughs> now, those tits better have like googly eyes or a mental health diagnosis or something because I have been promised crazy boobs and I will not accept normal range breasts. <laughs> My crazy boobs in bio. <laughs> Back in 1991, I took a trip to Niagara Falls with a friend. Um, and because we were classy, we stayed at the world-famous Cadillac Motel. And when I opened up the dresser to put my clothes in, here you're seeing the, the world-famous Cadillac Motel on your screen now. When I opened up the dresser to put my clothes in, I had to remove a nylon corset and wadded up panties. The Cadillac Motel, as you see, is still around today, but now it's marketing itself as premium and ironic. When I was, th this is a recent picture. And it looks very much the same as the place I visited in 1991. I bought a postcard that I still have. The colors were all different. They were like burnt sienna, <laughs> the Crayola color of the 1970s, uh, and much, much tattier than what you see now. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, my friend and I went to Niagara Falls to do all the tawdry tourist stuff because it's basically a miniature trailer park priced version of Las Vegas. Uh, if you've never been to Niagara Falls, it's a hell of a lot of fun if you want to do something trashy. Go to the Canadian side, though, it's better. So our first stop was the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. Do you remember Ripley's Believe It or Not? I loved that show. I love those kind of um, uh, museums of like screwed up stuff and teratomas, <laughs> things like that. 
So my friend and I walked in to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum and our eyes first settled on a little white taxidermied kitten under a glass cover. And then I noticed that it was a two-headed kitten and I immediately started crying because that is the saddest thing in the world when a little kitty is born with two heads and has to die because it has two heads. <laughs> now, I, you may not know this about me, but I have a real problem with Siamese twins. <laughs> it really, really bothers me. Especially the two-headed ones. <laughs> They they just they're just really really disturbing, so it's a good thing that there aren't many of them around. But these two, and you're going to recognize them when you've seen them. These two, or is it this one? <laughs> they keep popping up on social media. It's those two girls. <laughs> they them. <laughs> I think they. I think I saw a news story that these these chicks. Um, oh, no, I'm I'm going to screw this up. No, um, actually they are. One of them, I think the news story says, one of them recently got married. And I don't know how that's possible because they both had to be there. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what goes on? What, I mean, what, what, is it, what is it like? Hi. Hello. We have to go to the bathroom. I don't have to go to the bathroom, only you have to go to the bathroom. Well, we only have one butt. Oh, ah, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> That's been Potpourri to Mockery. Come back and see us after the final break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Years ago, I made fun of conspiracy theorists during a therapy session. My therapist, he's old, he's old school, he's hard ass, he's based, said to me, when I see people telling me not to pay attention to conspiracies, I know where I need to look. Now, this is the same therapist who told me that the quality a person needs to have in order to make real progress to get past childhood trauma is the ability to tolerate and understand that everything they thought they knew was wrong. And my experience proved him correct. Almost everything I thought I knew about the world most of my life was wrong. My view of the sexes, of politics, of economics, of empathy, of love, all of it, when I was the kind of leftist I was, turned out to be wrong. And then I realized that I was resisting considering conspiracy theories for the same reason that in those days I never listened to anyone but other leftists. And that reason was fear. Emotional investment in my view, that the world, that's what it was. I had a huge emotional investment in the world being the way I needed it to be, the way I needed to believe that it existed. It is only emotional investment. No thinking is taking place. It's emotional investment that makes people try to punish other people for considering kooky conspiracies. The facts of the world demonstrate that our governments and our media do lie to us and they do perform false flags. So yes, I will entertain so-called conspiracy theories about lots of things. That doesn't mean that I'll be convinced by all of them, I won't be, but I will be convinced by some of them. And in trying to understand the motivation of people who want to shut down talk about so-called conspiracy theories, uh, it's not clear to me. You'll have to decide the degree to which I'm, I'm actually empathizing and understanding where people come from and the degree to which I might be projecting. It's, it's some of both, I'm sure. But to the extent that other people are like me, or like I was, I believe it is fear that prompts us to shut down 
kooky ideas in others. It's one thing to think an idea is silly, but it's another thing to get angry at someone for saying it or for considering it. So w why did I get angry at what I considered to be conspiracy theories? What motivated me to want to get on social media and burn the purveyors of conspiracy theories? Well, it, for me, it was the fear that the world was much more dangerous or unknowable than I wanted to believe. Purveyors of conspiracy theories were destabilizing what I wanted to be true about the world. Now, I'm neurotic and much more fearful and anxious than the average person, but, but I think that that disposition is broadly true of many people today who call themselves leftists or who are uh, pretty far over on the left-hand side of the aisle. I suspect this fear orientation to the world is responsible for the emotionally extreme reaction that many leftists have to what they call conspiracy theories. And while I'm no longer a leftist, I am still neurotic. And it's a, it's a strange place for me to be in the 21st century uh, because my disposition is the same one that made me vulnerable to leftist brainwashing. I try to keep myself from easily falling for the conclusions that fear suggests. And I do this by trying to remind myself that I am neurotic and I try to not settle on the first answer that fear wants me to choose. But I don't really have any idea how well I'm succeeding. I mean, maybe I'm falling for fears on the opposite side of the coin now. But I do know that as a young person, as a young man, I put too much stock in my identity as a gay man, a leftist gay man, as a savior, as a writer of wrongs. In, in those days, I was convinced that I was a member of a very small persecuted minority. How hard it was to be a gay man and a leftist. Why people might even suggest, they might say things like homosexuality is not inborn. How would I ever deal with that trauma? I, this is how I used to think. I shouldn't have to hear any of this. It's too threatening. You're horrible for saying that. What I didn't realize then was that my political stance in those days was much closer to the mainstream or at least much closer to what the mainstream would quickly become. It is true that I lived through an era where gay people did not have the same legal rights to arrange a household and an economic situation that other people did. There was bullying, there was discrimination, but I didn't have it nearly as hard as I told myself that I did. Magnifying what should have been minor qualities like being gay into major qualities blinded me to how coddled leftist identitarians like me really were even in the 1990s. So today I look back and I laugh, I kind of shake my head. I thought I was an iconoclast who was speaking up so bravely. But how brave is it to write articles and have public arguments while you're wrapped up in the arms of a political and social group that has already beatified any allegedly marginalized people? I had a lot more support than I credited. But here's a spot where I can't separate my perception from reality. Today, it feels more dangerous to me to say the things that I believe today than it felt to say the things I believed when I was a leftist activist in my youth. Being a former leftist who turned conservative, um, especially as a gay person, today feels lonelier and more precarious than I remember feeling when I was young. Um, I'm, I'm curious, leave, leave a comment underneath this. What, what has it been like for you? If you've gone from left to right, what's been your experience? Like mine or something different? They say that age brings wisdom and clarity, and I think that's true, but it can also bring confusion. There are some things I've changed my mind about and that I believe I understand more truthfully than I was able to do when I was young. But there are just as many things that I'm more confused about and less confident about today than I would have been 20 years ago. And that's because I've seen, and you have seen, levels of evil that we had not experienced personally before the past five years or so. We've seen that the government and its institutions are capable of consciously lying about an alleged pandemic in order to suspend constitutional rights. Uh, there's no need for a long list of these items, 
it is a long list. And the COVID pandemic is just the most extreme and salient example of that. This changed me and it changed millions of people, it changed a lot of people who are watching this right now. It reset our rules of thumb and our measuring sticks for what could be true and false about the world that we thought existed. After what I've seen, I can't write off conspiracy theories easily the way I used to. I can't be sure that they'd never do that because they have done that. The loss of illusory certainty is difficult for us. It provokes fear and anxiety, and more than that, it shows us how limited our certainty and our knowledge really is. For example, take the recent crashing of a ship into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the motorway, in Baltimore, Maryland. <clears throat> Many people um, this week had been sorting themselves into sides of that question immediately regarding what the cause of the crash was. Now, remember, none of us know the cause, and we have no good reason to believe that any official spokesperson who's making a statement within a day of the incident about that statement, we have no reason to believe that he knows the deep cause either. We live in a world in which our governments or their companion entities and fellow travelers are willing to and capable of destroying ideas or physical infrastructure to achieve power goals. But we also live in a world in which ships are complicated machines that can have wiring problems and find themselves pulled along by dangerous water currents. That's also true. <clears throat> so was this an accident? Was it sabotage? Was it a cyber attack? I don't know. You don't know. But I do know that the commentators who were calling people stupid and gullible for entertaining that sabotage may have caused the crash, they had no good reason to do that. These people assume a priori that it is extreme and unreasonable to hypothesize anything but an accident. And then they leap to calling those of us who will entertain an alternative theory ridiculous or hysterical. These commentators are not doing this because they're wiser or they have greater access to the truth than you or I do. They're doing it because it causes them existential fear to ponder that it may be just as reasonable to suspect a false flag as a frayed wire. 20 years ago, I would have been one of those commentators. I would have been calling people silly and ridiculous. I believed that the US government was basically sane and stable and beset by bad apples, not endemic dry rot. Well, today I believe the political system is corrupt and evil to a degree that I would not have entertained decades ago. Knocking on the door of 50 years old this year, I've ended up simultaneously more and less certain about countless things. And it isn't always clear to me whether I've gotten any closer to the truth. What's it been like for you? That's the show. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll see you next week.